I will wait one more minute and then, uh, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for uh, Steadward Talks, where we're going to focus on the history of uh, sitting volleyball. Um, I'm David Legg. I'm a professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Canada, and I had the good fortune of being taught by Dr. Stedward, whom the Stedward Talks are named after as a doctoral student. And so uh, I'd say about two years ago, um, very good friends and colleagues of mine, Eli Wolf, who's on the call today, uh, Dr. Ted Fay, who's also on the call as an attendee today, and Dr. Mary Hums, um, the, the five of us, or, or the four of us, without Dr. Said we're going, um, we're chatting about the importance and the need to have conversations about histories within the Paralympic and Parasport movement. And that for, in many regards, these weren't being documented, they weren't being discussed, and that there were so many fascinating and interesting stories. And we also wanted to provide an opportunity um, by understanding the past to help us better understand uh, the present and the future. And then the last element that we talked about was always a hope to have these Steadward talks focus on inclusion um, and the connections between uh, different disability groups, uh, those with disabilities and those who are able-bodied and the connections amongst the various sports systems. So we're very pleased uh, to be able to have some outstanding guests with us today to talk about sitting volleyball. And before I introduce the four of them, I do want to uh, give a, a quick promotion to three future Stedward talks that we've already scheduled, which I, I think are going to be excellent. Uh, the first or the next one will be on October the 28th, and that one is going to focus on the history of sledge hockey. On yeah. December the 9th, we're going to focus on the interaction of uh, medicine and the Paralympic movement. And our, our keynote, our guest speaker is Dr. Sherry Blauet, um, yeah. who is Eli's wife. Uh, or Eli's her husband um, and so we had to really pull out all the stops in order to make sure that she was willing to do that uh, for us on on the on the December the 9th and then on January the 28th uh, Andrew Parsons the IPC president has agreed to spend an hour with us and to talk about um, the history of relationships between the IOC and the IPC and where those future uh, connections will perhaps go uh, so those are upcoming said we're talk. So we'll be uh, sure to send out those invites to our membership. Well, we really don't have memberships, but to the people that log in, we've kept your email addresses and we're now selling them to third party uh, marketing groups for a tremendous, tremendous profit. So thank you for allowing us to do that. That part was a joke. All right. So today uh, we're talking about sitting volleyball. And as I mentioned earlier, we have four excellent speakers. If you'll allow me, I'm just going to introduce them very briefly. Um, and then it'll be my job as moderator to try and steer us through uh, the conversation that we have the hour set aside for. We will uh, certainly try to allow for about 20 minutes towards the end uh, for questions and discussion. We strongly encourage attendees to use the chat function, which is on the right hand side of your uh, Zoom webinar portal. Um, and I'll try to ensure that you know, the questions and the comments that are being asked are being addressed, but I would also say to our panelists that you're more than welcome to respond to those as well, particularly if you're not talking at that point in time, um, just to keep, keep the conversation going. All right, so without further ado, our first speaker will be Peter June. Uh, Peter is the founding president of World Para Volleyball, uh, Para Volley, sorry. Peter has experience as a player, referee, coach, and in 1965, three years before I was born, started his administrative roles in volleyball, and he was instrumental in getting sitting volleyball as part of the Summer Paralympic Program in 1980 in Arnhem, and later became the first president of World Organization Volleyball for the Disabled until 2001, and then he became the honorary president. Kwok Ng, how, did, how was that for pronunciation? 
Quack. <laughs> he likes, I think he just goes by Quack. He likes to think that he's like Sting or Prince or Madonna. He's Beyonce, yeah. <laughs> But Quok is the current world volley, uh, pair of volleyball, pair of volley chief historian. He's also the vice president of the European Federation of Adapted Physical Activity and the European representative to the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity, IFAPA, of which is one of the, the founding partners, disability and sport being the other of these talks. And so it's a partnership of those two organizations. Uh, Quok has led the history project and has uncovered some of the earliest evidence of volleyball played by sitting down as early as the 1940s and is also captured and shared information through various podcasts. Our third speaker is Jenny Cole, who is the head of classifier education and one of the classification management group for World Para Volley. She joins us this morning from Australia. I should, have, I should have said earlier that Kwok joins us from central Finland and Peter is joining us from uh, the Netherlands. So this is quite a, an international collective that we have. Her in, early involvement, was as the national team physiotherapist for the Australian standing volleyball team at the World Championships in Poland in 1997. She was a national team physiotherapist for both sitting and standing volleyball teams for several years and commenced training as an international classifier in 1997, achieving international certification in 1999. In Sydney at the 2000 Games, Jenny was the medical coordinator for the Paralympic Games Organizing Committee and also one of the international classifiers for para volley at that event. And our last but not least speaker is Phil Allen from Canada. So again, a very multicultural group that we have today. And Phil has been involved in para sports since 2001, when he began as Volleyball Canada's manager of para volley and the referees programs. He's more recently provided consulting services to various Canadian volleyball groups and to the Canadian Paralympic Committee on multiple sport development projects. So welcome and thank you to our four speakers for joining us. I, I think, Jenny, it's midnight now in Australia. It's eight o'clock in the morning for me here in Western Canada and everybody else in between. So this is a, a truly a global discussion on the history of uh, sitting volleyball and we're thrilled that you're able to join us. So without further ado, Peter, I'm gonna ask you to go first. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to spend some time talking about kind of the earliest days and your involvement um, of sitting volleyball and if you could kind of take us up into the uh, when Arnhem hosted the games in 1980 and kind of soon thereafter and then I'll pass it off to Kwok um, to kind of take us then towards uh, the, the current status right now as it relates to the history of sitting volleyball. Peter, over to you. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have to jump through the history then. Um, in 1994, we, uh, you can uh, see that several ball games already have been developed in a rehabilitation center all over the world, um, for especially a military uh, rehabilitation center. Um, these ball games were uh, very welcome in the, uh, in the change in the rehabilitation process, um, but uh, it took a long time before uh, we came to volleyball in the first time, in the first, let's say, after the World War, um, especially in the German-speaking countries in Europe and in the Scandinavian countries, they designed their own uh, game with different rules. Um, in, only in 1955, this came over to the Netherlands and it was played a, a whole year in the Netherlands, but they were not pleased with it. And the Dutch Military Sports Committee was asked to, um, to develop or to, to find an, a, a proper game, a more dynamic than the, the sit ball games as used in the uh, other countries in Europe. Well, they came up with a popular uh, and uh, a popular sitting game and they called it sitting volleyball. It was volleyball but then sitting and the, some rules were adapted like uh, the size of the court and the height of the net of course. Um, it was sent back to the military centers for commands and advice and in, on the date the May the 5th 1956 they published officially the sitting volleyball room by a volleyball match 
in a national sport event in Amsterdam. And that was in Netherlands, the start of sitting volleyball. For the rules, they used uh, the FIVB rules uh, at that moment uh, from 1952. Um, they made the playing court 10 to, 10 to 5 and the height of the net was set at 120. The ball was a regular volleyball. International, however, the German uh, speaking countries and the Scandinavian countries still were going on with their sitball games. Uh, even when there were exchanges between the clubs in the Netherlands and the teams in, in Germany, then in Germany, the Netherlands, the Dutch teams has to play the sitball games. And when the, the German teams came to the Netherlands, they were confronted with the uh, sitting volleyball uh, yeah. rules. That gave, of course, always frustration by the one or by the other. The other problem was that there was not one sit ball rules in Germany. No, there were five different. And also in Scandinavia, they used their own uh, rules in each uh, rehabilitation center. They were all different. So it was uh, always frustration when teams met each other. Um, it was therefore interesting that the Netherlands uh, were invited uh, in 1977 by the ISMGF uh, to send in a bid for the 1980 games. In 1976, we all know we were in Toronto. I was also in Toronto uh, in that period. Um, it was well known that the 1980 games uh, should be organized in uh, Russia. But in spite of many actions from ISMGF to have a, a bid or a reply, at least from Russia, they never received an answer. At last, at last, at long uh, diplomatic way, they reached an, uh, an, an, uh, an answer that uh, Russia will not organize the 1980 games uh, because, as reason, uh, they do not have disabled people and so disabled sport was not practiced. Um, that was the decision. So, ISM just invited uh, the nations in, uh, to do a bid for the 1980 games. Uh, to organize the, the, the Paralympics in 1980. And three nations uh, the, that were uh, Denmark, uh, South Africa, and the Netherlands sent a bid to uh, Stoke Mandeville uh, for the 1980 Games. That was for the, the Netherlands a very good possibility to have <coughs> sitting volleyball on the Paralympic Games. It was one of the demands also. <laughs> uh, Two, um, the big problem uh, for the Netherlands was uh, in, uh, in that bet, in that bit, uh, well, we play sitting volleyball in, Net in the Netherlands, but in all the European countries and Scandinavian as well, the, uh, they didn't play uh, sitting volleyball. So if we want to organize the uh, 80 games with sitting volleyball, then at least we have to convince all the nations to play sitting volleyball because otherwise only the Dutch team was uh, in, in, the, in the games and that was not uh, the meaning of um, the competition. So uh, we convinced uh, in 1979 uh, uh, the uh, international federations, ISOT and the ISMGF, that we would like to have a pre-Paralympic tournament in Harlem. That was, is my place where I live here. And so in the first, uh, that we also invite the standing games because we do not have too much information outstanding volleyball. But as main goal, to invite all the sitting, uh, the sit ball uh, countries in, in Europe and in the world uh, come to uh, Harlem and 
let's play together and explain what we are, do, are going to do with since sitting for Libom in 1980. And um, then hopefully, hopefully uh, they all will enter a team in the Olympic Games. So the tournament in Harlem was very essential and it became ook very important because uh, uh, seven uh, uh, seats ball countries in, in, uh, in Europe entered the, uh, the tournament, the pre-Paralympic pre pre tournament in, uh, in Harlem. And that was an opportunity to, to speak with them, to explain them, to give them the rules um, uh, so they can, if they come to the Paralympics, they have a, a, a whole year to prepare their team uh, on, uh, especially with volleyball techniques, that is what they do not have. Um, it was very successful, and um, the well, the the victory was that they all uh, registered for the 1980 games. Mm -hmm. So we had in uh, in Arnhem eight teams who play sitting volleyball, and that was for really for the first time that that was very successful. The problem uh, were the classification. Uh, when you look uh, back uh, to all the situation in the military centers, also in the, in, in the European countries and in the Netherlands, they played uh, they or well, they played in the in the centrum with different kinds of disabilities. They were not only amputees, they, they were all kinds of, uh, also polios were there, and um, all, all kinds of different uh, disabilities. And none of them uh, was ever classified in a certain way, and certainly not under the uh, existing International Federations classification. So in 1979, when I uh, invited them to come to Harlem, I explained that there will be no classification because the rules for me were more important than the classification. The participation for me was more important than classification. So they all came here with all type of handicaps and they played it and they were very enthusiastic and <clears throat> that is what I want to see. Um, the problem in the Paralympic is that that was not under our control. The, the um, classification system was on the control of the international classifiers and in the classification rules of the federations. So a lot of players, unfortunately, were disqualified uh, in the 80 games already. In spite of the fact I had warned them in 1979, be careful if you come to in, in 1980, your athletes should have fulfilled the criteria for classification as um, <clears throat> published by the International Federations. But uh, that was not fully understood. So a, a, a lot of um, uh, disqualifications were there. Uh, it was also, when we go a step further in 1981, where uh, we uh, decided to come up to a, a international competition and uh, to come up with a discussion what will be our target group of players and what will be, will be our definite our rules. The easiest step was still that all the uh, uh, participation and participating nations in Europe uh, accepted the uh, published sitting volleyball rule already, what, what uh, were designed already in uh, 1956. And the only uh, change in the, in the rule was the height of the net. In 1956, we had this, uh, there was decided the height of the net should be one, um, 120, one meter, 20 centimeters. And in the discussion with the, in 1981 with the nations, only the net goes down five centimeters. So it, was, it goes back to 150. That was the only rule change that was uh, discussed. 
and they from that moment we we played international but also national uh, all the national federations in 1981 uh, decided to change their ball uh, game system into sitting volleyball and that was a big victory um, another greater problem was the classification problem uh, in you know, 70, it, it, yes. Jenny's going to be talking about classification later. It seems to me that all the problems seem to focus on classification. So I can't wait to have Jenny defend classifiers and yeah, yeah. the whole classification <laughs> system. Uh, so yeah. I'm looking forward to that. So Jenny, I just, I'm just kind of trying to prepare you for that, you know, the defense oh, yeah. of classifiers and. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, 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 I just. Uh, just like a two uh, minute. I, I do not go into de details. I just want out the points of discussion in, in the history. So, um, and, and classification was at that moment a very uh, important item. How are we going and what is our target group and how are we going to develop? And, um, and, and also for the, the sitting volleyball nations, uh, especially the, the Les Autres group was, uh, yeah. was very unclear, yeah? So. Well, and, and sitting volleyball was unique in that regard, correct? In that they had athletes with amputations, athletes with cerebral palsy, athletes who had had polio, athletes with spinal cord injuries. And so it was unique within the Paralympic context where correct. they were all playing together on the same sport. Correct. correct. And, and, and that is what we discussed. And, um, and what we used, in fact, because uh, everybody played with all kinds of types of disabilities uh, and that really doesn't give any problems um, the, the main thing is what they said is that um, let's say a very severe disabled athlete in sitting volleyball a, a double above knee amputee uh, is a very severe disabled person but in sitting volleyball he has a lot of advantage Right. Is so much advantage. And uh, the most disabled person in sitting volleyball is a person with two full uh, long legs. Because they, they have to go somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Peter, Peter, I just, yeah. I, I want to make sure that we give some time to Quok and to, to Jenny and Phil as well. Um, yeah. Are we able to just to wrap up in a minute as far as kind of the historical piece that you were touching on? And then we can pass it on to Quok. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, for, for me, uh, the, the start for the sitting volleyball and the, the picking up the rules where we go from 1981, that is, that's it. And from that point of view, there's, there has nothing changed since then. So, um, <laughs> so, so Quark's it, review of the history is going to be pretty simple, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Um, this is actually a challenging thing, tricky thing. And, and David, when you gave the schedule, I was thinking, oh, please don't tell me to do it at that period because trying to find information to fill at some time is, uh, was, was, was difficult. I think um, the, f the first thing is, is that um, this history project that, that you guys are doing is wonderful and it fits in really well with, with the history project that we're doing um, with World Power Volley. And I, and I think... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's great that we're able to try to capture this because you know Paralympic history is has has typically been you know washed aside for 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 some time now, and it's good that we're able to to get some of this information. It's great that we got these recordings. It's great that we have the IFAPA YouTube channel to look at these recordings as well. And um, so um, you know, I, I think there's a couple of things whereby. To, to fill in on the gap from the 80s in terms of um, the development of the sport because you know all the major excitement really seems to have happened in the build-up to the 80 games but actually what what I found from um, getting some of the material so for myself I wasn't in that era to live through that so it's great to hear from Peter because he was there and it's he's able to share that from, from my perspective I've been able to interview certain people uh, including Peter as well to, to try to tidy up um, some of the, uh, well not tidy up, but just try to collect together what has happened with the organization. So um, I, I think one of the key things that we're looking at is the organization of how that developed. So 
kind of from the 80s to the 90s, um, the volleyball committee was created. Um, and, and then there was uh, volleyball committees under the ISOT. And that was the, one of the, the, the things that it had to kind of break away from um, eventually so it could um, run things really autonomously because there was lots of discussions and lots of development with regards to, as, as we've heard already, with the classification. So one of the one of the first things that we found was in the ninety. When I say we, I mean there's a team of people that I, that I that we try to get together to build this history. So it's not just me. Uh, just just one thing to mention about that. So I, I'm using we most of the time here, and as well. Um, uh, so anyway, but in, in the 1990s there was the formation of the European zone. So already there was a lot of the European teams were playing. In fact, pretty much it was Europe plus a couple of other countries um, outside of Europe. Egypt was, the first, was one of the first ones out there. Um, then there was USA because they were hosting the 84 games. Um, and, and, uh, and then there's Iran later on from that. So that's the kind of period of building across the globe. And, um, and then it was 96 where formerly the World Organization Volleyball for Disabled, so WVD was formed. And, um, and as a result after that, so we've got the European zone and then we've got the international organization and then we start finding different regions of the zone. So one of the regions was uh, the Af Afro-Arab zone um, and then that was formed after the WVD and then there was the Power um, Pan America or the Pan American zone at the time it was called and now it's, it's Power Body Pan America. So, um, so now we've got most of the zones covered um, and then there's the branding side of things so in 2001 there was a new logo and um, and there was quite a big shift in terms of the organization in terms of sitting volleyball it was really perhaps the start from the Paralympic side of things to introduce the women's team as well as with the men's team so preparation for 2004 so then 2004 you've got both men and women playing in, in the Paralympic Games um, and, and then in 2010, so after much, uh, much more development, then formally an African zone was created. And um, one other area that was um, really pioneering from this fantastic volleyball organization is that they rebranded again from the WOVD because um, uh, it sounds a bit kind of strange. Um, volleyball organization, volleyball for Dis um, world organization, volleyball for disabled. So the branding became World Power Volley. Now it's kind of interesting because although um, um, Paralympic sports, IPC sports started to call Power Athletics, Power Swimming, Power and such and such, that happened after World Power Volley rebranded themselves. So actually, who takes ownership <laughs> for that rebranding of, of disability sports, you know, and power sports. Uh, so I think this, this is a real, you know, great innovations that what some of the innovations that they did. And, and now they've got this fantastic chief historian, you know, and, and whatever, whatever power, power sport organizations have, have that as well. I got, yeah, 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 you know, so it's, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of my wrap up really. I'll, I'll be kind of short because I'd love to have more discussions. Um, about this. Um, so a quick whistle stop tour. Um, I, uh, I, I, I am going to pass it on to Phil and Phil became involved in those early 2000 years and I want to get his perspective on some of the current opportunities and challenges but a couple of things just before, just while I'm thinking of them that I want to come back to I know that there are some people on the call here that are involved in sledge hockey and I'm interested in kind of following up on the men's and women's kind of team development side of things and whether or not there was ever a a thought given to mixed gender teams or were there differences in the evolution of the men's team versus the women's team and how that all pulled, kind of folded out. So I don't want to necessarily get that, but Tara, I know you're on the call and that's, you know, kind of a, a conversation that we'll probably have as it relates to sledge hockey and in subsequent um, Stedbert talks. But I think it's an interesting anecdote perhaps that we can build on uh, when we come back to some questions. But Phil, I want to give you a quick chance to chat as well. And then Jenny, I certainly want to get your perspective because again, it seems <laughs> that, class you do. <laughs> that the classification is the root of all evil and all challenges within, uh, within, within Parabolic. But Phil, you know, very quickly, uh, what, so we, we've tracked the history from, you know, Peter talked about from kind of post-World War II and a rehabilitation uh, setting to, you know, the kind of the first time it was hosted in Arnhem in 1980 
Hawk talked about its spread internationally through the various uh, regional affiliations and to its kind of its, its status in the early 2000s and being the forerunner um, for, the, for the branding that the IPC has now taken on. Can you maybe talk a little bit about kind of the current status of, of sitting volleyball in the world of para volley right as, as it stands right now? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's what you mentioned about um, about mixed gender is, is an interesting topic for, for maybe the question and answer period and, and down the road. Because that's uh, that's that's something that we haven't considered immensely in our in our federation, but um, at certain levels it's very appropriate. Um, so uh, I began with uh, World Parable in 2013. I was brought in as the general manager, um, and even though the federation had been around for many years and had seen a sig significant amount of growth at the time that I came in, administratively. Uh, World Parabole at the time it was still WOVD, but administratively it was still a fairly young federation. Um, and that's absolutely no fault of the directors. Um, but the sport and the, the federation um, needed to grow. Uh, Parasport in general was at sort of this unprecedented time of visibility, and a lot of that had to do with the popularity of London 2012. Um, the, as everybody knows, you know, that was a, a, a massive event with respect to the visibility of the Paralympic movement. And we as a federation had to, to grow with, with it. So we needed to you know, look at ways of increasing our revenue, our human resources, um, our footprint on the, the world's parasport stage. Um, we needed to find more opportunities for athletes to compete, to become classified, and for athletes themselves to become visible, um, to increase our grassroots programs at the domestic levels around the world. Um, and to work closely with the IPC and with WADA to meet their classification and anti-doping codes. So that was, those are some of the, the major challenges that we faced when I started in 2013. So some of the highlights that we, we, we can talk about from 2014 forward, um, you know, we set about trying to meet some of those challenges. So since then we've almost quadrupled our revenue and we have a lot of in-kind revenue or in-kind uh, items from sponsors. We've almost doubled our membership, and we're always looking at ways of, of uh, modifying our membership level to try and increase that membership base. Um, improving member engagement, we've increased personnel in all areas from our commission commissions all the way through to our board levels. Um, we're holding and supporting more competitions and having more opportunities for classification. We have a massive increase in our online following. Um, we, one thing we've been really successful at is, uh, is working with the Agitos Foundation in terms of getting some grant uh, opportunities from them. And since 2014, uh, we've received over 115,000 euros in, in grant money from, from the, the program. Um, and they've used some of our programs as models as, of, of best practices. Um, we've, you know, we, we talk about classification and you know, throughout this whole period, we've remained compliant with the IPC classification code throughout all of its, its you know, nuances, but at the same time, retaining as much control as possible over our own system and our own athletes, um, which probably Jenny might speak to a little bit in a few minutes. Um, in 2019, we were pioneers in, in establishing um, athlete representatives on our voting athlete representatives on our board of directors. So we have one male and one female athlete position on our, on our board. Um, we ran uh, a multi-zonal online election um, for our Athletes Commission, and it's been recognized by the IPC's Athletes Commission as a best model practice as well. Um, we're starting to pioneer uh, remote classification for certain very specific mm -hmm. athlete impairment types. Uh, we're running an online general assembly for the first time. So we're trying to embrace all those challenges and, and move forward in a very, very proactive way. Um, and you know, where we're at today is, is we're, we're, we're fairly solid as, as, a, as a very um, sort of, I'd say a small to mid-sized international federation based on our budget level. But I think that most of us in our community agree that we, we really do punch above our weight. Um, you know, we, we, we have a, a very active board we have uh, active commissions um, while having only myself as one part-time staff person. Um, so some of, the, some of the, yeah, exactly, the smallest violin, eh, right? <laughs> um, 
it's uh, some, of our, some, some of our future challenges and opportunities. I'll just go through those and then maybe we can, can move on. Um, for our membership, we've seen more members pop up in, in all of our zones. Pan America is, I think, on the, on the verge of, of exploding. Um, Fair of all, Europe has a great core of nations and they're, they're historically our strongest base. But there's still work to do to move forward with some of the new nations that are, that are moving forward with Caravalli in, in Europe. Um, Anti-doping education is, is really massive right now to make sure that we remain compliant with, our, with the WADA code. Um, classification issues are always ongoing. Uh, finances are always a challenge. You know, we, we try to roll on a quadrennial budget where uh, we look at at the end of our, our quad, are we ahead or are we behind based on those four years of budgeting as opposed to looking at an annual, annual stream. Um, with COVID, you know, this is this has created immense challenges around the world of sport, um, and it's, it's, I don't think anybody else in the of us in the sport world are, are considering that it's going to end. Um, that these challenges that COVID is facing is, is providing us is it's is going to end in in 2021. It's forced us to look at sport and delivery in in innumerable different ways. Um, and it's uh, that's something that's that's you know we're going to have to evolve with and find find best ways of, of, of working around it, working with it, because it's going to be a reality in our society for 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 a while. But Phil, I do I want to make sure we get to Jenny too and talk about classification. If I can just get you to wrap up. Yeah, I'm I'm just on my last <laughs> couple of points here. Um, so we have we have uh, we're also moving forward with beach para volley with uh, that's a, a standing version of of, uh, of disabled volleyball. So we're tr on a track to try and get that as part of the LA 2028 Paralympic Games. And one thing that we're really trying to work hard on is to find initiatives and the best way to move forward with further engagement of women in sport. Um, that's that's something that that I know Barry holds our our president holds close to, to his heart and something that we're going to be working towards in the next number of years. Um, one, one thing across Parasport that is, is really big that we need to be careful of is how do we find a balance between too many competitions and not overburdening the athletes. The athletes are, they have jobs, they have lives, and sport, it's not a hobby to them. Sitting volleyball is not a hobby, it's a massively important part of their lives. But if we have too many competitions, then there's funding struggles, there's uh, scheduling troubles for, for individuals. So there's this line that we need to try and follow. This is my last point. Um, and Eli, on our call the other day, you touched on it in that sitting volleyball is so great for so many reasons, but first and foremost, it, it's accessible. Mm. If anybody of you, you uh, know of John Castle, he's, he's the first one to send out that picture that he's playing sitting volleyball in a boardroom somewhere and he has a string tied between two chairs. You know, the, the floor is, is the leveler. Um, you sit on the floor and, and everybody has the same, the same um, maximum ability to perform on the volleyball court. There's no external device required. There's no wheelchair. You, you don't need a horse. I mean, well, you could play with a horse, but that would be difficult. Um, it's very easy to introduce to school groups and conventional volleyball players and groups love it because it forces them to look at the sport in a different way. Coaches love it because it forces them to look at, at you know, different ways that they can, can uh, can move forward in their own conventional volleyball coaching and programming. And it's a super easy sport in terms of translation to the public. Mm -hmm. um, very, the, people see volleyball, people see sitting volleyball. You might have a couple of questions, um, you know, things like why can you block the serve? But those are technical questions, but people generally have an understanding of what volleyball is. And at any level of volleyball, it, it's, it's the same elements are there. And really, you know, I spoke of John Castle, you know, all you, all you need is a ball and maybe a string <laughs> and you can play, you know, um, the, st the string can be the net. Um, you know, you see, we've seen all these different videos uh, through COVID of people, you know, doing their backyard training and they have this platform on an angle that's in front of them that they've built out of plywood and they set the ball themselves, they attack, it bounces back, they set it, block, like these different creative ways, but you can do it yourself and you don't need very much to be able to, to play. Um, so that's, that's what I love about it the most, I think, is that it's, it's so accessible um, at, at all levels. Thank you, Phil. All right. 
And so Jenny, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. And, I, and, and Phil and, and Kwok and Peter have all kind of touched on different elements of the evolution of Parivali and how they relate to classification. And I think, you know, and, and Eli loved this idea of, you know, what Phil just alluded to right at the very end there, this idea of inclusion and the possibilities yeah. of multi-disabilities uh, people who are able-bodied being able to participate in the, the kind of the, the intersection of all those things. And I, for me, I, I, I find that fascinating as well. From a classifier's perspective, talk a little bit about some of the, the changes and evolutions that have happened within Parabali. And, you know, you were involved in the 2000 game, so it's the 20th anniversary of the games um, in Sydney. Now, it's amazing. It's right through the Olympics right now. <laughs> that, was, that was 20 years ago. It's hard to believe. Um, and then Dr. Sidward, I just want to again, you know, prepare you for some kind of summative comments towards the end. And you were certainly the president um, in 2000 of the IPC. Um, and we're involved in that transition that when Peter was talking about from the Arnhem Games in 80. Um, so I just want to make sure that you're prepared to kind of provide some summative thoughts towards the end. And again, I really want to encourage people to provide some comments and questions um, in the chat function as we're getting ready for more of an open discussion. But Jenny, over, over to you. Thank you. And look, um, I am very used to, as a classifier, being seen as a source of all evil. Um, but I think, um, so, so be gentle with me, um, I can talk forever about classification because while it is something that tends to elicit quite a bit of consternation, um, it's actually something that is really, really critical in the Paralympic movement. It's the most unique thing, really, um, because we have people across all of other different sports who have a multitude of different impairments and disabilities. And so um, right since the early days, classification has been the core way to be able to structure competition. If you can imagine all of the different range of disabilities and impairments there are, you can't run a million different 100 metre races. You can't have you know, 80 different classes in, in volleyball. So there is always going to be that tension between creating a structure that is as sports specific and credible as possible has few enough classes that make sense, um, but still, um, you know, there, there is going to be a variation in classes. So there, there's always that tension. And there seems to be this expectation that we can make it perfect. And that's always going to be impossible because with the range of impairments there are, there are always going to be those people that sit right on the border. Um, so I'm happy to talk a little bit, and I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about more generally just briefly framing why we have classification at all and what some of the key sort of themes are of classification. Um, I'll have a bit of a chat about how classification has evolved generally. Peter touched a little bit on that, um, and I'd probably like to expand on that a little bit because it's very relevant to us in, in Paravoli. Um, happy to chat about some of the challenges generically about classification, and then to talk a little bit specifically about volleyball, if that works for everyone. Well, just just a reminder, we got about four minutes. Five minutes, yeah, four minutes. I can, I can go quick, right. So if you can, I talked a bit about the challenge of, you know, a thousand, um, you know, a hundred meter races. The challenge that we have, the purpose of classification is to ensure that the outcome of competition as much as is possible is determined by skill and talent and training rather than by somebody having more or less impairment or a team having more or less impairment. Um, Peter touched on the fact that in Paravoli, we have a really wide range of physical mm -hmm types. In Paravoli, we only have physical impairments. We don't have vision impairments. We don't have deaf. We don't have intellectual impairments. So we're a physical impairment kind of group, um, which is where uh, the amputees and les autres, which is French from the others, came from. So there's always this challenge of how do you create a system that um, allows people to compete reasonably, equitably with the different impairment types. Um, going back before, say, Barcelona days in 92, we had classification, which was blind classification, wheelchair classification, amputee classification, cerebral palsy classification. It was very disability specific. And you would compete in that same class across all sports. And it became very evident that some, as, as Peter was saying, somebody with, for example, a double amputation, if you're getting them to run with their prostheses or to swim, a massive impairment, but put them in sitting volleyball and it's less so. So there was this evolution of gradually having um, very sports specific classes um, and some uh, sports like athletics, for example, um, still kind of have a quasi, you know, impairment streams within theirs, whereas we are very much integrated. Um, in sitting volleyball, we have two classes. 
um, VS1 and VS2, which used to be um, VS1 was disability or more disabled, I suppose, and VS2 was the minimal. Um, we're only allowed to have one minimal on court and that's, that's our rules in our sport. Um, I suppose what I've experienced since I got involved in 97 is that not only have we become more sport specific, so para volley is the authority of its own classification system. What became really important is that we wanted to professionalise it across all sports, not to make it the same, but to have certain levels of standards about how we treat athletes and what information we give them and consent and privacy and you know um, how we have quality of assessment and that's where the IPC classification code comes in. I don't want to get into the challenges that that about the balance between IPC and nation uh, and, and international federations if we can avoid that but I think one of the things I've seen as a really positive thing is that it's forced all of us to become much more accountable, much more professional, much more consistent um, in what we do with classification. So we've evolved over time and become more consistent. Um, and I suppose the code is aimed to harmonise those processes without dictating what our classes need to be, um, by and large. The biggest classifications that are challenges, I guess, that I've seen in, in, in volleyball is, as we've evolved over time as well, is that there is some quite different philosophies one philosophy is if you're able-bodied, you're actually disadvantaged for sitting volleyball, so therefore you should be allowed to play at the Paralympics. Clearly at a Paralympic level, that's never going to be acceptable. Um, and I guess there's that, you know, uh, there is some, some challenges in how people see it and often what people see on court, you can't always see what the impairment is and we often get asked, oh, what's that person got? And, and, and we can't discuss that, obviously, um, from a privacy perspective. One big challenge we have is, if a referee makes a wrong call or a call that is challenged, it will affect one point, maybe a set. It's very rare that it will affect a game, um, a match or a, or a competition. Um, in classification, it can affect an entire career and it can affect an entire group of athletes. So we take it very seriously to be as good at what we do as we can be. Um, but it makes a big difference if somebody is in the more disabled class rather than the less disabled class, particularly when you're only allowed one minimal or one VS um, two on court at a time. So we have had some challenges as of all sports with intentional misrepresentation where people don't show you their full capacity. Um, and we have probably got one of the world's leading um, processes around how we're managing our misrepresentation. Um, and we've had some fantastic legal representation um, to help us do that. It's always going to be a challenge um, to try to find um, the right uh, thing to do with people on a borderline um, and to manage that real tension that there is with classification. But I think we're probably, um, you know, Phil mentioned earlier, some of the things that we have that are best practice, um, our athlete, um, our, our protest and appeals process, our misrepresentation, our training and accreditation of classifiers, um, all of those are considered, um, you know, best practice by IPC. Um, and, you know, I think we'll, we'll always continue to try to improve. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions, so I'll stop there, I think, and because I think people are going to have specific questions, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. And, you know, you made reference to, and, and it, what I really liked was this recognition of some of the challenges with minimal disability and, and certainly we're seeing that in a conversation right now with wheelchair basketball and, and classification and I was the one who said that I didn't want to bring up that conversation um, but it you just know, perhaps, <laughs> you know, perhaps it's the elephant in the room and again I don't want to I don't want to get into to that end because we, we don't we just want to have the time to do it but it's that intersection of people who are able-bodied people who have disabilities um, the, the difference between the standing volleyball and the sitting volleyball and the transition from one to the other and perhaps a return to a standing volleyball opportunity in 28 Los Angeles with beach volleyball. And, you know, and, and again, Phil, you made reference to the, uh, the adaptability of sitting volleyball. Like I, so I, I have my students play sitting volleyball and adapted physical activity at the university level because it is an opportunity to participate in an inclusive format. But Eli, I want to pass it to you because I know you you wanted to start with one question to the panel as you know as, as a generic question, and then we, again we have about kind of eight minutes where we do have an open opportunity to to have questions. So by all means, to those who are attending, please feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we'll try and get to them. Eli, over to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you all so much. This is really wonderful conversation, and to gather this history 
Um, I guess just the one question I wanted to pose was really about the popularity, kind of following up on what Phil had to say and uh, many of you touched on, but also from a strategic standpoint in terms of whether or not it is country level looking to put sitting volleyball into the school curriculums. You know, are there efforts being done to, you know, really strategize around how, you know, the way, the same way, you know, sports are really thinking about inclusion of individuals with and without disabilities. You know, could there be a world championships of sitting volleyball that's inclusive? Um, but also more about the school level. I, I know I've done it at school. One time I did it with a, with three and five year olds and the ball was too heavy. And so I had to switch to a balloon, but still like we made the sport happen and it was powerful. So I guess if you could just touch on that briefly about this notion of the popularity, because it is such an amazing sport and, and, and how it can just grow and grow and, and particularly at the school levels. Yeah, that, it's, it's something that, that we've often talked about at our, our development level. Um, it is something that, you know, We've, we've always tried to encourage our, our, our nations, our member nations at the domestic level to, to lead. Um, you know, I, I think that any, any of us that's been involved in, in World Paravolley or WOVD or Sitting Volleyball or whatever, have run these kinds of clinics. You know, my kids go to a school with 300 students and 300 of those students have played Sitting Volleyball. Um, you know, but that that's, that has nothing to do with, with Volleyball Canada even. That, that, that's me with, with my personal appreciation of, of uh, trying to, to you know, embrace parasport within a, a young community. Um, what, what we try and do is we try and make sure that we're available to, to provide simple resources and simple tools to be able to, to, uh, to assist people moving forward. We don't have anything formal. No, we often get questions, you know, how can I introduce this? And to introduce it, we don't throw them the sitting volleyball rules of the game. You know, <laughs> but that's the worst thing you can do is bombard them with information. What they want to do is, is, is mm. a simple yeah. thing. Can I, can I add on that a little bit? Um, I think um, World Power Volley has, has done some amazing work in this area as well, actually, in terms of working with um, a person called Matt Rogers. He's done this resource set called Volley Slide, which is a really helpful, simplified version for teachers and and um, and beginners of the sport to to kind of get an idea of how they may adapt the sport to make it as inclusive as possible. Um, but leading on from that, I think also in recent years, there's um, from from other conversations, very new partnerships with other organisations where experimental games can take place. Um, so one of the partnerships is with the um, um, this uh, this organisation that's also based in Stoke Mandeville. I don't remember the name of off the top of my off the top of my tongue. We were trying to get if Apple was also looking at partnership with them as well. But uh, they have their own international games as well, and there was mm. potential chances for different rule changes or experimentation, like maybe mixed gender games as well. Depending on that, there's also the youth European Power. Power, um, Paralympic um, games as well, where there is the youth version of it as well to try different versions of it. Um, so even it, like, you know, a, like, phys, like even thinking about like FISU, like the World University Games, because if the sport grows at call universities and then it's just yeah. an additional sport that whether you have a disability or not. So kind of yeah. interesting. So thank you all for addressing that. Yeah. Um, I, I want to I get to Abby's quick question here. And again, we don't have a ton of time, but at Abby, Abby, thank you for submitting a question. Um, so she says, we often talk about classification from an elite Paralympic perspective. What does it look like for grassroots development and youth level? And how early do you start classifying for Paravali? And, and is it appropriate to include athletes without disabilities at the quote unquote lower levels in order to expand opportunities? So, uh, thoughts? Uh, you want me to start on that one since it's got the word I'll, classification? <laughs> yeah, I'll, you start, I'll, I'll follow up on that too, Jenny. Yeah, great. Um, so look, um, I've also been the National Classification Manager within Australia across all sports. So uh, again, we looked at that right from the grassroots level and did grapple with the question. And people often do have the perception that classification is just for elite sport. But I go back to my comment about 
if you're going to run an event, you need to have a way to structure your competition. Um, and certainly from a participation and fun perspective, there's no reason whatsoever to classify it. But once you have somebody who has an impairment or a disability, in general, people want to do sport that they know that if they're good at it, they can go somewhere with it. And so we started introducing classification as, as early as in primary school um, for athletics and for swimming so that people could actually benchmark themselves and know whether or not they were, they were able to be um, successful or not. So I think there's a real place um, for classification at an early level, even just to help people make good decisions about um, what sports they want to pursue. And by that, I don't necessarily mean they have to have the full sports specific classification. Um, in New Zealand, Andy Parkinson introduced, um, and they introduced a, a kind of a generic classification and we're doing something similar um, here in Australia uh, as well around providing some of the baseline assessments so we can say, look, here's the range of, of sports you'd have an eligibility for to be able to help people start to benchmark. So I think as soon as somebody wants to identify, have I got a future in this sport? They need to have the opportunity for at least a national level classification. Um, and I will just say that for the inclusion of people who are able-bodied is an absolutely critical element of almost all Paralympic sports at a development level, especially a massive country like USA, Canada, Australia, um, where people are spread so far and having that inclusion of, um, you know, physios and OTs and brothers and sisters and, and, and various different people in the sport at that early phase is great. And we have it right up to a national level um, uh, to be able to play um, uh, with a certain number of people in quite a lot of different sports. Mm -hmm. may, I, may I? I, I I'll, I'll nod may ahead I? for you. Peter, by all means. Yes. Okay. Me? All right. Yeah. Um, my, my, just my um, situation is that um, I always ask, um, what exactly is the purpose of the classification? Um, what do you want to reach with that? Um, when I, I only look at sitting volleyball in, in this time, because I, I have with um, di I, different sports exactly the same uh, opinion. Um, it, in general, the classifications were designed for uh, uh, paraplegic sports. And when you see to the whole history, this model, whatever designed for paraplegic sport, is automatically cop uh, copied to ISOT, empathy sport, is automatic uh, copied to uh, CP sport, and is automatic copied to less other sports. And, and I always have uh, 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 promote the situation then, do it, make a classification system for each type of sport. Volleyball must uh, have to, and has decided her own sport. And um, is it necessary in a team sport that you protect players? Um, and what you see in uh, sitting volleyball in the last classification, that it is what uh, with the gray spaler, uh, the uh, Jenny indicated already um, that they were not are not protected. Mm. No, they were are excluded. Uh, so they are punished by uh, the classification. And this this player has a permanent uh, disability, a severe disability. He, he or she cannot take part in able body sport on medical reasons and that can be proved and now she's punished by the system by a paper system that she cannot play in the team internationally mm. and the difficulty okay that there are more difficulties but that is my uh, my point uh, so what is the need to punish athletes with a classification system and not the, the function. What's the function of it? Right. Unfortunately, we don't have an hour to kind of go down that rabbit hole. Um, <clears throat> Peter, I very much appreciate your thoughts and your comments. And I'm, I'm seeing a couple other questions here from Shirko and, and Laura, and I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to, to get to those today because we quit on, we've wrapped up. We've, we finished. Dr. Sedward, I want to make sure that we give you an opportunity just for some final summative quick thoughts. Quick reminder, we will be sending out reminders of our upcoming Sedward Talks, again, focusing on sledge hockey, focusing on the intersection of medicine and the Paralympic movement, and then in January in the new year, 
We're going to have Andrew Parsons, president of the IPC, talking about the intersection of the IOC and the IPC. But Dr. Stedward, thank you for joining us. Uh, some summative thoughts from you to wrap up this fantastic Stedward talk. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lagan. And, and I just wanted to very quickly say thank you so very much to Peter and Kwok and Phil and, and Jenny, though this was, um, uh, again, uh, another very inspirational uh, session. And when I listened to all four of you talk from from the earlier days of, of Peter Yoon, what, you, what you've done, uh, Peter, right up to Phil Allen and, and everything in between, um, it, it just goes to show you how far we really have come with uh, para-sport in the world. Remember that uh, when I was first involved in the, uh, in the early 60s, th there was only Stoke Mandible game for spinal paralyzed internationally. I mean, we in Canada, I'm not sure other countries involved, amputees, les autres, cerebral palsy, visually impaired. We had sports for old, but it was all based on disability. It was never based on sport, except if you, many of you might remember, is skiing. Skiing never did have it by individual disability. They always were very much more inclusive. So we could have learned an awful lot from our winter sports friends. But the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why uh, IPC was discussed in the 80s and created was to learn from uh, our history and the mistakes we made and to become more inclusive, to include other disabilities, to include other sports, but first of all, to develop an, a, ma a major or international organization that was based on sport, not disability and to look forward to inclusion of uh, more, men, more women uh, involved in our movement, uh, ensure that our classification was embedded in the sport and became more functional. I remember doing the classification system in 1972 uh, in Heidelberg with Gutman walking down the, the tables of so-called patients lying there saying, well, you're 1A, you're 1C, are you kidding me? Uh, and I, I mean, it was very rudimentary and, and not very sophisticated. But, but what we've seen today is another indication uh, of the rich history that we have uh, in, in Paris sport in the world today. And I'm so happy that our, our, our different sports have gone on to uh, develop their own <laughs> federations so that uh, they can provide the kind of leadership unique to their sport even though we need to come together at times to discuss, uh, you know, a Jenny classification on a generic basis for all sports, for all disabilities, for, for men and women. So we've got, we've come a long way. We've got a long way to go. And I just hope that we've got a Messiah sitting out there somewhere who can take all of this history and put it together in encyclopedias that are accurate. That's Eli. Eli's that guy. Yeah, because the more I read, the more I see, uh, the more I see, gosh, we've made some mistakes. And because that didn't happen then, this didn't happen then. And we've got to get it before uh, some of us uh, pass on. <laughs> no, Thank no, you, yeah. Jenny and Phil and Peter and Kwok. It was so nice to have you here. And Jenny, nice to see you again. And Peter from uh, such a long time ago. But uh, I'm just so happy with with uh, what's happened here today and look forward to the uh, sledge hockey, the medical, and uh, of course, Andrew Parsons uh, uh, coming up in January. Well, thank you, Dr. Shedward, for your final thoughts. Thank you to our four panelists for joining us today. I'm sorry we, we, we keep this to an hour because in part because we wanna try and keep it concise, but there's so much to talk about. I always feel that we need to add a whole other hour onto our conversation. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's just enough time to get us all fired up. That's exactly. it. You know, you know, exactly. Now we have to go back to work. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, um, I, hope, I hope you're able to join us on October the 28th. Tara, who's on one of our attendees, will actually be one of our panelists on the 28th when we're talking about sledge hockey. Um, I wish you the best. Thank you for continuing to uh, follow and participate in these conversations, Eli and and I and Dr. Sedward and Ted and Mary certainly enjoy having them. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, okay, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Take care. I'll have the recording to share. Thank you all. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.